Hello, everybody. Welcome to the seminar. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Jim Gushka, who's our speaker today. Um, so I know Jim from having met him at a really very cool conference called Psychology of Technology. This was held at Berkeley a few years ago. And I was very impressed that Jim was uh, very excited about bringing HCI into data science. And we've kept in touch, and uh, more recently, starting about two years ago, uh, we began to work together in a project called the Tesseray Project, of which Deloitte is one of our field sites for. So Jim received his PhD from University of Chicago in philosophy. Uh, and uh, in case you're wondering, his favorite philosopher is David Hume. Uh, he spent time at University of Wisconsin as a professor. He's been at Deloitte since 2001. And when he started at Deloitte, there was no data science field yet. He was, he was in data mining. Um, but since then, he's become chief data officer at Deloitte. So with that, I uh, introduce Jim. Okay, thanks everybody. So yeah, everybody, my name's Jim. I've been at Deloitte for about 20 years now. Um, my story is that after getting my PhD in philosophy, I wanted to do something in the, in the business world that involves science. And back then, the two op there was no data science field at the time, obviously. That, that just didn't exist at the time. And so I sort of did process of elimination. And I thought, well, one, one possibility is going to Wall Street and getting a job as a quant and you know, investment bank. I got such a job offer, but I didn't take it. And the other option was um, actuarial science. So I actually got my, my start in uh, data science as an actuary. Um, so I've sort of like been part of the movement of the insurance industry adopting machine learning techniques and predictive modeling techniques. I did that for a couple of years. I built um, the first credit scoring model for all state insurance company about 20 years ago. Joined Deloitte in 2001. Um, and when I kind of made that pivot from working in sort of like a corporate research center to a <coughs> consulting environment, um, I was using the same mathematical techniques. I was using like regression modeling and machine learning. I, I was one of the first guys to use decision trees in random forests at Deloitte, you know, like circa, you know, almost 20 years ago or about 20 years ago. But the flavor was different in a way that it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around. And so when, when Gloria says, I, you know, I've, I've been bringing HCI into data science, I didn't even have that vocabulary. I guess, I guess that's what I've been doing. So I'll describe to you, you know, the way I think about data science and AI and how sort of human psychology is sort of the dark matter of data science in a certain way. And that might be obvious to you guys. I feel like I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be carrying coals to Newcastle. I don't know if I'm going to be te te telling you anything you don't know or you don't already believe. But maybe this will be interesting at a meta level. That what I'm going to be describing is very new to the audiences I describe it to in the business world. So anyway, at any rate, maybe I'll learn more from you than you'll learn from me. But I'd love your feedback. I'd love any questions. It's a very small crowd. So if anybody has any comments or questions along the way, please speak up. So yeah, it's been a very interesting experience kind of doing data science for the past 20 years. Because I've seen it go from being the sort of hidden thing that no one really understands to about 10 years ago, it became a big trend in the business world. And it's been through several hype cycles since then. Like big data was a, was a term you couldn't get, get past a couple of years ago, which was, you know, caused me no new grief. Now it's machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence. These words are, are on everybody's lips right now. And there's a lot of hypes around it. Um, this is Andrew Ang, the former Stanford professor, a pioneer in artificial intelligence. And he says that AI is the new electricity. And that's kind of a hypey statement, but it's also true in the sense that AI is what economists call a general purpose technology. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the steam engine or electricity or information technology or the railroad. It's something that can cause kind of permanent, lasting transformations to broad swaths of the economy and therefore to society too. And you know, 100 years ago when, when electricity and steam engines came online, people could kind of intuit that this is going to change a lot of things. They couldn't quite see how it was going to change things or what, what, what form this is going to take. And this is probably where we are right now with artificial intelligence. So that's fine. But I, I, I think a lot of the thinking and a lot of the planning, a lot of the investments around AI are a bit muddled right now. This is what I call the AI master narrative. You know, it, 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 we're all using the word AI, but I think it means something different than what, what the founders of the field um, said it meant about 60 years ago. So AI started at the Dartmouth Conference, Dartmouth um, University in New Hampshire in the summer of 1956. And the grant proposal read, every aspect of, or any, any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. 
So they, they, they really thought that in the same way we have calculators that can make arithmetic calculations, we can kind of reduce thought to calculation in a perfect language and just replicate that in a computer, right? If that's what, if that's what cognition is, if it's, if it's basically glorified calculation, well, that's what computers are good at. So why can't we build computers to kind of replicate every aspect of human thought? Why can't we build sentient computers? And one of the founders of this field was Marvin Minsky, um, who went on to advise Stanley Kubrick when Kubrick was making movie 2001. Because back then, they thought that around 2001, why not? Why couldn't we have computers like HAL? It didn't quite work out that way. But the way we talk about artificial intelligence since then is always a man versus machine narrative. It's always this narrative that machines are getting smarter than people. Okay? So, you know, you know, if, if, if we have a computer that could be Gary Kasparov of all people at chess, well, that's the brain's last stand. We're, you know, we're, we're approaching this point where computers are generally intelligent. And this has made a big comeback with IBM Watson. Um, when IBM came out with um, the computer that beat um, uh, Ken Jennings on the, on the game show Jeopardy, again, it was a similar story. How on earth could we build a machine that could actually understand wordplay and irony and answer all these questions? That just seems incredible. It seems like we're, we're approaching this point where machines are generally intelligent. Um, and a couple of years ago, when AlphaGo beat Lisa, Lisa et al., the New York Times quoted a business school professor at a very prominent business school in Europe saying, Google's AlphaGo is demonstrating that for the first time that machines can truly learn and think in a human way. So this is the way people in the business world are thinking about computers, and they're, they're approaching this kind of general intelligence. And so therefore, it's just a matter of time before computers put us all out of work. They're going to computerize away a lot of jobs. There's this book, The Rise of the Robots, by Martin Ford that came out a couple of years ago. And I think Martin Ford was inspired by a study from Oxford University uh, by two Oxford Business School professors, Fry and Osborne, who uh, predicted that about half of US jobs are at risk of com computerization. Okay? Um, and the philosopher Nick Bostrom at Oxford goes even further to worry that you know, we're in danger of creating this kind of like super intelligence, an ex intelligence explosion where uh, computer, the evolution of computer cognition rapidly outpaces the, the evolution of human cognition, and we simply just get left behind. And that really is sort of an apotheosis of what Marvin Minsky kind of thought was going to happen 60 years ago. Um, one of Minsky's former colleagues once told me that um, someone asked Minsky, aren't you worried that we're going to build these kinds of computers that are just going to outstrip our cognitive abilities and become a, a superior race? And Minsky said, well, yeah, but I'm not worried about it. I'm a, I'm a superior being to my pet, and I treat my pet well. Okay. And it's like, that, so that's sort of the, that, 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 that kind of way of thinking of artificial intelligence is sort of like a residual thing in people's minds when they, when they use these terms, I think. But that's not really what AI is. And if any of you disagree, please speak up. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective of if, if you think I'm getting this wrong. Um, that might all sound kind of academic and sure, people say stuff. It doesn't really affect you know, what the decisions people actually make. But back in January, a colleague of mine emailed me a New York Times dispatch from the Davos World Economic Forum. And uh, the, the, the gist of the article is that you know, in public, all these titans of industry, we're talking about human-centered AI, and AI is augmenting human capabilities and extending our abilities, but what they really want to do is cost takeout. They really want to automate as many jobs as possible and reduce their work workforces to a bare minimum. Now, aside from the ethical problems with that, I just have scientific skepticism about that. I think that overestimates what the current state of play in AI is, or probably will be in the foreseeable future, and it also underestimates what humans bring to the table, all right? So I think this master narrative kind of like gives people sort of a, a, a blurred understanding um, and skewed perception of what artificial intelligence is. So that's sort of what, that's the story I don't like about AI. The story I do like about AI, I'm just going to quote a guy I know, Chris Hammond at Northwestern University. He's also the founder and CEO of Narrative Science, which is a, a prominent natural language generation company. He, he wrote that it's, AI is basically the development of computers that are able to do stuff normally done by people. This is part of the original definition from McCarthy back in 1956, but he's you know, kind of taking it very literally. And Chris just says any program can be considered AI if it does something we would normally think of as intelligent humans. How the program does it at all is not the issue, just that it's able to do it at all. So it's AI if it's smart, but it doesn't have to be smart like us. So this is more of a functional definition of artificial intelligence. That's another kind of, again, I think it's a kind of a common misperception. Most people sort of identify artificial intelligence now with machine learning. I just think that's kind of a category mistake. I think machine learning is one thing you can do to achieve algorithms that can do things that only yesterday humans could do. But guess what? Kristen's definition also applies to an automatic teller machine. You know, that's what we in the business world call robotic process automation. You can, you can build a macro that does things that yesterday a human had to do, but now we can have a machine do it. And there's actually a lot, of, a lot of work in the business world, just kind of automating routine tasks. 
But we also have new forms of AI that are enabled by new forms of machine learning, or really old forms of machine learning that are com coming into their own because there's so much data around now. So, you know, a lot of you guys, I'm sure, have used neural networks. I've, I've fit models using neural networks. When I used neural networks 20 years ago, it didn't get me very far. It, it, you know, with, with the data I was analyzing, it wouldn't really, it, it's sort of all negatives without, without a lot of positives. I got a kind of uninterpretable model that wasn't much, much more predictive than, than, a, than a linear model. But now we have web scale data, and now we realize that the same deep learning models we, we were trying to use 20 years ago, all of a sudden now that we have web scale data, now we have you know, millions of photographs labeled um, by humans, well, we can, we can apply those deep learning models to photographs and, and we can have things like photographs that recognize faces or help um, oncologists recognize tumors better than human can. So that's a, that's a new form of artificial intelligence. Okay. So that's what AI is really. It's not sentient machines, it's just kind of like different algorithms that, um, that, uh, that do things that only humans can do yesterday. So fine, that's, that's the narrative I do like. The problem with all this is that what we're seeing more and more of is that there's a lot of artificial stupidity coming from the application of artificial intelligence, all right? And there are a lot of examples of this. You read about, you can't, you can't open the newspaper these days without hearing about a new form of artificial stupidity, right? So one is group polarization. It's just a natural psychological tendency of people to kind of self-segregate, right? So there's a famous experiment that Cass Sunstein and, and Daniel Kahneman did about 10 years ago to illustrate this phenomenon. If you go to Boulder, Colorado, and get a bunch of people to just deliberate and discuss topics like gun control, abortion, climate change. What happens is the sort of modal opinion of people deliberating, if they're all sort of like-minded to start with, moves to the left of where anybody started with. And if you go to Colorado Springs, the opposite thing happens. So that's called group polarization. If you have people, do, if there's not a lot of diversity in your group, you kind of self-segregate. Now, if you take that kind of natural human tendency and we create environments where people are getting a lot of their news through social media. And we're using the same artificial intelligence algorithms that we use to generate book and movie recommendations for Amazon and Netflix. If you start applying those same algorithms to news and information and opinion pieces, you're going to pour gasoline on that little flame of, of you know, the, the tendency towards group polarization. So that's just kind of artificial stupidity. All right? Another example is if you, if you give somebody a car and you call it a self-driving car or an, an, an autonomous car, and the owner doesn't have a good mental model of what a, an autonomous vehicle is or what, what automatic means, they might not be paying attention when they should be paying attention. And you know, they might be you know, just you know, kind of spacing out when they really should be paying attention in a dangerous situation and crash, crash their Tesla. Or we can design um, uh, social media applications to dictate people or give people fear of missing out, you know, um, give them to, to, to Facebook likes. <coughs> You can release chatbots um, online, and if, if they're uh, trained by, by discourse on the web, guess what? They turn into authoritarian, uh, racist chatbots. Um, a, a big big company, Amazon, recently built a machine learning model to help guide its hiring decisions. I was actually talking to a guy from Amazon the other day, and they have a, it's a big business challenge for them is hiring drivers, for example. They have to hire hundreds of people a week, right? And so wouldn't it be great if you could like, automate that process by just you know, using natural language processing and other predictive modeling techniques to try to figure out who's going to be a good Amazon employee. But when they did that, they realized that the algorithm they built gave negative points to words on resumes that, that indicated the person's female or, or female names. So they, they never used the algorithm, um, but, they, but they realized that we can't do this because you know, they're pre-existing social biases. They're just being encoded in these algorithms. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to this idea that we're not creating artificial intelligence. We're basically doing statistics on steroids. We're, we're building pattern recognition techniques. And you have to pay attention to the sampling frame, right? In classical statistics, or in say polling, you want your sample of data to reflect the way the world is. But there are a lot of other cases where you don't want your sample to reflect the way the world is, right? If, if you have all male employees, you want to create a sample that reflects the way the world that you want to be. So some, sometimes creating the right sampling frame has ethical considerations, all right? So, that's another example. Now, that wasn't artificial stupidity because actually they were very smart. They actually audited their own algorithm. They never used it. They pulled the plug on it. So, but it's an interesting phenomenon. Almost the same example um, is um, this young woman at MIT Media Lab. She's a, a graduate student there. And one day she sat in front of her friend's computer. And the web, you've, you've seen the story, right? The, 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 the webcam you know, picked up her friend's face. But when she sat down in front of the computer, it didn't recognize her face. But then she did an experiment. She just took a featureless white mask and put it over her face, and all of a sudden the computer picked up her face. Okay? So again, if you train a deep learning algorithm, it's just another regression algorithm, um, on, a, on a, a, a set of uh, pictures of, of, uh, of light-skinned faces, it won't, it won't recognize dark-skinned faces. So if you, if you train your algorithm in, in, algorithm in Palo Alto, it might not work in Pondicherry so well. 
So those are all examples of artificial stupidity. And they're all very different. I'm just being flip when I call it artificial stupidity. But it's like, it's, we want AI, but we're getting the opposite. And so what is the problem here? And what I'd like to float is uh, an idea that maybe a useful, maybe a useful organizing principle for all this is that these, these forms of AI need, need a notion of human-centered design. So smart technologies are unlikely to engender smart outcomes unless they're designed to promote smart adoption on the part of human end users. So therefore, effective and ethical AI needs some notion of human-centered design. Okay, that, that's what I'd like to talk about. Is this, is this sensible so far? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yep. And again, maybe I'm carrying coals to Newcastle, but <laughs> yep. Yep. okay. All right. Um, so yeah, so what a human-centered design, and I've backed into all this, I, you know, just through my experience working as a consultant. So doing data science in the consulting in the in the consulting world and being trained as a philosopher, um, he's kind of got me to this point because we don't, you know, in, in the business world, people don't really care about algorithms; they care about outcomes, right? <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I can I can build a great hiring algorithm that predicts, you know, with you know, very high AUC that this person will be a successful, successful Amazon employee. But you know what, if the people don't use it right, or if it has these other unintended consequences and the regulators pick it up, you know, it's, it's not good, I've wasted my money. Or even more blunt example, you know, early in my career I built an insurance underwriting model for, for, a, for an insurance company. And the company uh, data scientists, the actuaries, they said this is great, they, they validated themselves that it made sense, it validated out of time, out of sample, the whole thing. But they didn't use it right. The underwriters, when it was released, they weren't trained in it. So they used the algorithm to give discounts to good risks, and they didn't commensurately surcharge bad risks. So they just started collecting less revenue from a good model. So that's a very simple case of artificial stupidity. So just thinking about how like, there's this mismatch between a good algorithm, but the use wasn't right. That, I call that the last mile problem, going from, output, or from, from algorithmic output to a better outcome. That's the part where kind of human psychology is very often the, the dark matter. It doesn't, doesn't really get, it doesn't any kind of like, there's, there's not necessarily a science to getting that right. There's a science to statistics, but the other sort of like muddling through, and it's not always articulated very well, at least in the business world. Maybe you guys are doing a better job. <laughs> so anyway, effective and ethical AI needs human-centered design. Human-centered design is, I believe, a tagline that Don Norman came up with. Don Norman is another UC professor. He, uh, he is a UC professor. He's at UC San Diego. He's basically the founder of this field of human-centered design. He wrote the classic book, The Design of Everyday Things. I'll tell you guys later how I came to read that book a few years ago. And I actually met him last year, and I had the terrifying experience of doing a fireside chat with him at a MedTech conference in San Francisco, so I had like triple uh, imposter syndrome that day. Mm. He said early in this book that the problem with the designs of most engineers is that they're too logical. We have to accept human behavior the way it is, not the way we wish it would be. All right, so he gives some pretty modest examples in his book that are pretty vivid. The one, I know you've encountered this before, right? There's a door that you're supposed to push to get out of, and it even has a little sign that says push, but there's a pull handle. And so what do you do? You pull it. We saw this at the Thai restaurant last night, David. I just, I noticed this. Um, you pull it, and you feel like an idiot, because you're pulling this door that has a push sign. But the guy or the gal who should feel like an idiot is the designer of the door. Because that's a, that's a, a very simple example of a technology that's not designed to go with the grain of human psychology. It's a very simple bit of technology that you need an instruction manual to use. Or you know, if you're a if you're a, a young parent, you have kids using a stove. Would you rather have them use this stove or this stove, right? This stove you have to kind of remember which knob goes for which burner. In this stove, it's kind of obvious, but now it's sort of embedded in the system. So you can use this technology without without uh, an operating manual. And the opposite of a norm, it's, this is called a Norman door. So the opposite of a Norman door would be an iPad. You know, it's a it's a very complex technology that you can use without an instruction manual. And I, actually, I, I um, my mother's 80 years old. She's an artist, and a couple of years ago. I gave her a present, I gave her an iPad. Because I, I read that David Hockney is an artist and uses the brushes app to paint his paintings. He's displayed these paintings in the, in the Louvre. And my mother is, well, she's 80 now. She was probably 75, 76 at the time. And she's a complete technophobe. She can barely use her, her dishwasher. But she took the iPad out of the package and started doing a drawing of, of one of the buildings across the street in real time without an instruction manual. So that, that was really a triumph of human-centered design. That, that's what, that's, a big reason why Apple is one of the most valuable companies in the world right now. It's not just the technology, it's the fact that human psychology was reflected in the technology. And what I'm telling my data science and AI colleagues is that we, somebody needs to write the Don Norman book for data science and AI. And I'm not saying that this applies to AI, but what are the analogous principles that we need to bake into AI, okay? And I have another talk where I can go into more details, but I did, I didn't, I didn't, it's Friday afternoon, I didn't want to kind of go there. But I, I wrote an article a couple years ago where I, I took a stab at this and I came up with a bunch of principles. If you have place interested, I'll send it to you. So, so Don Norman was a psychologist. He actually, I believe he, co he was like, I believe UC San Diego is the first cognitive science department. 
okay? And, and that's where he is. He's still, he's 80 years old, he's still teaching there. He's the head of the design lab at UC San Diego. And he's a psychologist by training. So, you know, psychology is inherent to all this stuff. And so it's interesting to think about what we've learned about human psychology since the 1956 Dartmouth Conference, right? Back in 1956, I believe behaviorism was in the heyday in psychology, you know, the kind of Skinner box kind of approach to psychology. And, you know, logical positivism was a big trend in, in philosophy at the time. And we've learned a lot since then. So in the last 60 years, uh, I'll talk, talk about two what I call psychology lessons. One is more of its paradox, you know, this, this idea that, you know, when, when, we, when we build a, a computer that can beat Gary Kasparov at chess, or can beat Lee Sedol at AlphaGo, that is just mind-blowing. Or when we build a computer that can just, you know, retrieve the world's information on Jeopardy. These are obviously things that most humans can't do, right? Gary Kasparov was the chess master, because he had this unusually strong ability to memorize a lot of chess patterns and recall a lot of chess patterns and use that to win chess championships. But it's just a matter of time before computers, which are really good at pattern recognition, are going to beat, beat him at that game. Okay? So things that are really hard, really hard for humans are very often very easy for computers. But what people forget is the converse. Things, things that are very easy for humans to come naturally to us are actually very hard for computers. And that's the common sense reasoning problem. So I can't, I can't help but quoting Alison Gopnik. She's a, a terrific writer. She's a, her, her brother's also a very accomplished writer. She's a psychology professor and a philosophy professor at UC Berkeley. And the way she sums up more of its paradox, she says, one of the fascinating things about the search for AI is that it's been so hard to predict which parts would be easy and which parts would be hard. At first, we thought that the quintessential preoccupations of the officially smart few, like playing chess or proving theorems, the corridas of nerd machismo, uh, would prove to be hardest for computers. In fact, they turn out to be pretty easy. Things that every dummy can do, like recognizing objects or picking them up, are actually much harder for computers. And so it turns out that it's much easier to, to simulate the reasoning of highly trained adult experts than it is to mimic the ordinary learning um, of every baby. So that's the first thing we learned about psychology. And even in that, even you know, in the IBM Watson winning Jeopardy episode, that's when AI made a big comeback about eight years ago, we saw that. Right? So now, I'm not criticizing IBM Watson. It was a brilliant feat of engineering, and it did win after all. But there's one, one point in the episode that gave you a little glimpse into this. There's a question, US cities. And the answer to the question, um, or the, the, the question was, this city's largest airport is named after a World War II hero. It's second largest after a World War II battle. And you're supposed to answer, what city is this? So maybe you don't know, but you can take a guess. Is it Columbus, is it St. Louis? The answer is Chicago. It was the Battle of Midway, and then O'Hare was, was a fighter pilot in World War II. So the answer is Chicago. And IBM Watson answered, what is Toronto? After all, it's built by American you know, engineers. So they don't know what Canadian cities are. But no, the, the point is that was a failure of common sense. So a, a human, it's, it's not to criticize it. It's just like a little like a fruit fly experiment, right? It's like it just shows you like the way it's reasoning is not not a, not, not a kind of like a human way. So that, so if something like this were used in the real world, like say for medical information, like retrieving medical information, this is what IBM tried to do after it won Jeopardy. They tried to build medical information retrieval systems. You'd want to set it up in such a way that the doctor is given enough clues about what's going on and has a good enough mental model of the technology that he or she would know enough to override the algorithm and not just kind of like listen to it. So you wouldn't want the equivalent of a doctor using a system like this to make a medical decision. You wouldn't want that to be equivalent to the Tesla driver who just kind of like turns over everything to the computer. Because the computer will be good at some things, but the computer won't be good at, um, at, uh, at, at situations that haven't been encoded in the database or that require common sense or just kind of black swan events. Okay? So, we, so we need to kind of like figure out what is the computer good at, what is the human good at, to kind of figure out how to get them to work together as teams. So there's actually a pre, and to, to illustrate that, uh, there's a nice illustration that was the prequel to Jeopardy. Um, and that's when, when um, uh, IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov about 20 years ago in the mid-90s. Um, after Kasparov was beaten by the computer, do you guys all know this story about how Kasparov invented the new game of chess called Advanced Chess? Do you guys know about this? No. No? Good, okay. So, he, so Kasparov invented a new game of chess called Advanced Chess. And Advanced Chess was, it could be Gary Kasparov using a computer to compete against another grandmaster also using a computer. And now let's see who wins. And what he learned was, or what he experienced was that it's sort of like comparative advantage wasn't quite there. He wasn't as awesome at advanced chess as he was awesome at, at old school chess, right? Because he was very good, remember, at pattern recognition, which is what the computer's also good at, okay? And so this came to a head um, in 2000, wait, when was it? It was 2005. There was a global online competition, an advanced chess competition called freestyle chess. You guys know this? And freestyle chess was anybody could enter. 
Gloria and I could team up, right? And we could use whatever computers we want, and we could be we could play against Gary Kasparov using playing with IBM Deep Blue. And guess what happened? This is a global competition. The winners were these guys, Zach and Steven from New Hampshire. They're two amateur chess players using three ordinary laptops, each equipped with a different chess program. So it's a big upset victory because they actually did beat grandmasters using supercomputers. And people couldn't figure out what was going on. And I, I read this when it came out in 2010. Gary Kasparov himself wrote a very nice essay in the New York Review of Books. And I remember reading it. It didn't quite strike me how significant this was until much later. But what Kasparov said was that these two guys, their skill at manipulating and coaching their computers to look very deeply into positions counteracted the superior chess understanding of their grandmaster opponents and the greater computational power of the other participants. So a weak human and machine and a better process of the human and machine working together was superior to a strong computer alone and remarkably superior to a strong human machine but an inferior process of working together. Okay? And so that, to me that illustrates um, where I'm going with this. You know, creating these processes goes beyond maximum likelihood in machine learning and non-parametric statistics and deep learning, right? We, if we're going to create teams of humans computers working together, we need some notion of psychology and design thinking baked into the process. So we need something like, I, I, often, I often make a rhetorical comment when I talk to data science colleagues, right? Data science is what people used to call greater statistics. And greater statistics is the kind of thing that Borg Smith studies, right? Anything you can do to learn from data sets. Well, now we need greater data science or greater AI, or whatever you want to call it. It's got to be data science, but with psych psychology, design thinking, behavioral economic, ethical type considerations baked into it. So we need kind of like a larger, a larger uh, discipline. And so a couple of years ago, I, I was thinking about this, and I was trying to write all this stuff down. Right? The, the, the best way to learn about something is to try to write an essay about it or to, or to teach somebody about it. So I wrote an article called Cognitive Collaboration, in which I tried to kind of like Think about this idea that we, sh we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be aiming at smart machines like in that master narrative I started with. We should really be thinking about systems of humans computers working together. That's when I came, came across this freestyle, well actually it was partly inspired by the freestyle chess thing. And I learned that um, you know, this is not a new idea. Even though the tagline AI has made a comeback, I think what today's AI really means or it really should mean was actually foreseen a long time ago by J.C.R. Licklider, another psychologist. So he wrote a classic essay called Human Computer Symbiosis. Right? And, you know, the, the hope is that human brains, computing machines, will be coupled together very tightly and that the resulting partnership will, will think as no human brain has ever thought and, and process data in, in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. So human-computer symbiosis. In a way, I've been doing human-computer symbiosis in freestyle chess my whole career. It occurred to me later in the sense that I've been using, using software to do statistics. I don't, I don't just do things by hand, right? I've used the R statistical computing environment for about 15 years now. So I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of the giants. I'm, I'm using tools that other people have encoded, but I'm using it in kind of creative ways. So I'm, in a way, I've been sort of like a, a Zach and Steven for statistics, right? So this, this, this kind of stuff is appearing all the time. In, 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 a, in a lot of ways, it's not an accident. The reason why R took off in the data science field is that human-centered design was essentially part of the R system. They really tried to design the software system to, to go with the grain of the way statisticians think. So it's a very small example of, of human-computer symbiosis in the real world. Um, I think that Lick, one of Licklider's um, protégés, or people that Licklider influenced, was um, uh, Douglas Engelbart, the guy in Silicon Valley who invented the mouse. Um, and Douglas Engelbart he had this famous you know, mother of all demos where he introduced the mouse, the graphical user interface, you know, word processing, you know, all in one big demo. The guy who did the camera to record the, the mother of all demos was Stuart Brand, mm -hmm. the guy who wrote the book, the, uh, the Whole Earth Catalog. You know, so there's this kind of like, this is where the hippie movement kind of intersected with the Silicon Valley. And in the first um, issue of the, of, the, of the Whole Earth Catalog, they actually quoted J.C.R. Licklider. So all this stuff is kind of like interconnected in a very interesting way. And of course, the person who eventually commercialized the mouse was this guy, Steve Jobs. And he said, this is what a computer is. It's the most remarkable tool we've ever come up with. It's the equivalent of a bicycle for the mind. And he's making the point that humans are not the fastest runners. The condor is faster than the human. But humans are tool builders. So we can build these tools for ourselves. And a human on a bicycle is actually faster than a condor. And that's, 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 that's the kind of thing we should achieve with, with computer technology. So this is sort of, sort of where we need to go with, our, with artificial intelligence. So that's human psychology lesson number one, is Morvik's paradox and its, and its implication is that humans and computers are complementary forms of intelligence. And if they're complementary forms of intelligence, that should imply that bringing them together in ways that they can counterbalance each other's relative strengths and weaknesses 
should create what J.C. Lecleter was talking about. The system is greater than the, the, greater than the sum of its parts, and doing so requires an attention to human psychology. Okay. So human psychology lesson number two is the Daniel Kahneman cognitive revolution, if I'm using that word correctly. So thinking fast and slow. So let me say a few words about thinking slow, and then I'll say a few words about thinking fast, and the way this influenced some of my thinking at uh, my, my work in a consulting firm. So thinking slow. Um, I got my start at Deloitte. Remember I told you I, I, I left a, an insurance company that I did work in a, uh, in a consulting firm, and my work took kind of slightly different character. All the, the reason why I was working for companies with less, less amounts of data is the companies with, with less data that tend to have less money to you know, pay data scientists' salaries. So we tended to work for companies with trickier problems that involved maybe sparser data sets. So instead of building a, a big machine learning model to you know, help Allstate figure out how much to automatically charge somebody for an insurance risk, maybe I'd build a, a machine learning model to help a small commercial insurance company decide how much should we, should we charge the owner of a restaurant to, for workers' compensation insurance. Now for a problem like that, there's just not enough data, there's not enough richness in the data to build a machine learning model to automate the process. Right? So the way it works is that when an insurance company makes a decision like that, they send a human underwriter out and they look at the business and they say, well, gee, this, this business has been here for 20 years, the owner is really responsible, you know, there's never been an you know, accident here, this looks just terrific, right? But, the, but you know, the, the underwriter might be blind to certain things. Maybe the, maybe the underwriter just likes the owner. Maybe he eats at the restaurant and he likes the, rest of the, the food of the restaurant. Maybe he got a really good night's sleep the night before, right? There are all these things that kind of like get in the way of a good judgment. So it turns out there's an old body of literature coming out of the psychology community. It started with Paul Meal at the University of Minnesota. Who here knows who Paul Meal is, just out of curiosity? Have you guys heard of Paul Meal? Or the field of clinical versus actuarial judgment? So this came out of the University of Minnesota um, in, uh, right, uh, right around the same time as the Dartmouth Conference. Paul Meal wrote his book, uh, Clinical versus Statistical Judgment, in 1955. He calls it his startling little book, I think, or his disturbing little book. Meal was a, um, he, 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 by the way, he was a philosopher, but he was also a clinical psychologist. And what, he had this revelation. He realized that simple regression models outperform clinicians in making diagnoses of schizophrenia. And that really surprised him. And so he started doing other kind of bake-offs between humans and computers. And what he realized was that simple predictive models could be you know, other types of clinicians making diagnoses. It could be university admissions officers deciding who to admit to university. It could be people predicting the outcome of football games. There's an economist at Princeton named Orly Ashenfelter um, who built, a, I think, a three-factor regression model that could predict um, uh, the price of, of Bordeaux vintages better than wine critics could. And the wine critics thought this was just outrageous and idiotic. <laughs> but Ashenfelter's an economist, and he wrote a newsletter called Liquid Assets, and he made a lot of money off of it. And the book Money, or the movie Moneyball, and the book Moneyball by Michael Lewis was um, an, an illustration of clinical versus actuarial judgment. You guys, you guys know the Moneyball story, right? It was, it was a story about the Oakland A's, another California story. And the Oakland A's, I'm not a baseball fan at all, but the Oakland A's is a cash poor baseball team that couldn't afford to, to pay top dollar, top dollar salaries for the baseball players, right? And so you'd think that they'd be doomed to languish in the rankings. Because every time the Oakland A's got lucky and hired a good baseball player, the New York Yankees could just double their salary and scout that baseball player away, right? So what could the Oakland A's do that's different? And if you've seen the movie or read the book, famously they started using data analysis. They started using numbers to drive these decisions. So rather than a scout looking at this guy and saying, wow, he looks good in that uniform. Boy, his girlfriend is attractive. I bet he's a confident baseball player. That was in the movie. You actually say, wait, the data says that this guy's on-base percentage is better than this other guy's, right? And even though he looks like a misfit, the data is saying he'd actually be a good baseball player. So you start to override the judge, the kind of like intuitive judgments of the baseball scouts and just kind of like, not blindly, but they just try to follow the data a little bit more. And lo and behold, they actually start rising up in the rankings. They actually assembled a team of players, right, that was, that was actually better. So that was, that was an example of both Paul Meal's clinical versus actuarial judgment, but it's also an example of behavioral finance. That was an example of an inefficient market that exists in the real world. Right? The, the definition of, of an efficient market is a market where the price of an asset reflects all the available information about the asset. Well, in this case, the assets are the baseball players. That was your human capital. The price of the asset are the salaries. Or, I'm sorry, the, the available, and the available information were all the baseball statistics that even amateurs could use, but were being ignored by the scouts. So the price of the assets didn't reflect all the available information, therefore the assets were mispriced because people were using intuition, which they were overconfident about, 
rather than analysis of data. Okay? So that's a very simple story. And that's exactly what was going on with my practice in its early days. We were doing clinical versus actuarial judgment for actuarial science, ironically enough. We were doing it for insurance. And the companies that used our models would save millions of dollars a year. And I, I couldn't understand it because I felt like our models were just too simple. Like, you know, aren't you already doing all this kind of stuff? But no, it turns out that the human underwriters are very good. They have a good causal understanding of why these different variables would make sense. So like, how far does the owner live from where he or she works? What is the commercial credit score of the business? You know, how much turnover is there been? How many years since it's changed to ownership? These are all good variables, but what we're bad at is on a case-by-case -case decision, weighing those variables together in a, in a systematic way. We tend to overgeneralize from personal experience. You know, we confuse how easy it is to imagine a scenario with its probability, with the availability heuristic. We might make different decisions before lunch versus after lunch for a low on blood sugar. All right, so, this, so I think that Daniel Kahneman um, has sort of helped us, you know, in, in, in any of his diversity, helped us understand why this happens. So they, they've uncovered a lot of the um, bias heuristics that drive our actual decision making. So there are a lot of illustrations of this. Um, you know, another behavioral economist, Sendhil Malinathan and Marion Bertrand at the University of Chicago, they did a, a field study where they'd, they'd send out resumes to uh, real life job offers. And they just made up names to go on top of the resumes. And what they found was that resumes with names like Emily and Greg got more callbacks for job interviews than resumes with black sounding names like Lakeisha and Jamal. And they just took the same names and resumes and scrambled them up and reached them with more job interviews. And Lakeisha, Lakeisha and Jamal still got a much smaller number of, of, of callbacks. So that's an example of cognitive biases, right? The fact that these kind of like heuristics that we use to make decisions rather than analysis of data can lead to biased decisions. Um, just parenthetically, I was in Austin, Texas, giving a presentation at an informs conference there. This is a picture I took of, of, uh, of the audience in one of the uh, um, uh, talks I went to. It was a sea of, 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 of males, right? And so, you know, so these, these things have effects in the real world. So, you know, even though we've known for 50 years that this is the problem, that we're actually bad at making decisions, we should use data more than just kind of unaided judgment to make decisions, that, and that biases can affect our decisions, we're still not doing this in the real world. We're still making hiring decisions, pretty much, just using unstructured job interviews. And that can lead to, and the, the reason why there's so much gender bias in the workplace, uh, this is a major reason that, that, that feeds into that, I think. So that's bias, but also noise can affect our judgments, too. Now this is um, not an uncontroversial study, but it illustrates the point, okay? This is a study of, of judges making parole decisions. Um, and you know, if, you know, David, next time you have parole, remember this. Six, at 9 o'clock in the morning, 60% of people are given parole. By 10.30, that shrinks down to about zero. After the mid-morning snack, it spikes up to 60% again. There's been controversy about this. So not, I don't want to you know, hit this specific study too hard. But that, that's, that's a different source of error than bias, right? Bias is the first one. These, these kind of mental rules of thumb, these mental heuristics, are systematically biased. In the, in the real world, you know, in kind of real world decision making settings, they can be ameliorated, but there are, there are these biases. But noise is an independent source of error, right? Your blood sugar level, the judge's blood sugar level should not affect, right, you know, who gets paroled. Or right now it's year end review time at a lot of companies. And would you rather be up for, for promotion first thing in the morning or would you rather be the last person they consider, right? So that's noise. And actually, as it happens, I happen to know right now, Daniel Kahneman and Cass Sunstein are writing a new book right now. It's on noise. That will just be noise. And a lot of people think, me included, that a major reason why algorithms have such, um, are so economically beneficial, it's not just the bias. By definition, algorithms are not affected by noise. And so just getting rid of noise is a hugely beneficial thing to do. And we still don't do it completely systematically. So this, again, this is kind of a JTR look lighter thing. We're really good at understanding the causal drivers, and we're really good at helping design the algorithms. But when it comes to case-by-case decision-making, we're terrible, and we don't even understand how terrible we are. That's sort of like the implication of psychology lesson number two, what, what Kahneman and Tversky have learned about, about the failure of probabilistic decision-making. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Um, it's not that simple. You know, algorithms can be biased too, right? So this is a, the, the most notorious example that's, been, that's made the headlines. This is an example of, I think it's the most commonly used recidivism algorithm. You know, the algorithms that help judges to um, better forecast who's more likely to recidivate and commit another crime if they're released on, on parole. And these researchers found that it had a false positive rate that was twice as high for blacks as for whites. Okay, so it's similar to that kind of Amazon hiring example. Even here, it's not quite so simple. It turned out that the, uh, the models actually were equally well calibrated for, for Caucasians in, in, um, in, in, in African Americans. But it turns out that equally well calibrated and same false positive rate are two different aspects of fairness that can't be reconciled if the overall base rate is different. So it's kind of a fraught thing. But the, the, but the, the point I wanted to get at is that 
we don't want to get rid of judges making parole decisions, but we want to have judges use these algorithms as inputs. So this is this, um, exactly what I would tell my clients 10 years ago. The underwriters always assumed that it was one of these you know, master of narrative things. The, even 10, 15 years ago, the underwriters always assumed, oh, here come the, the quants. They're just trying to put us out of work. And they're like the Philip Seymour Hoffman character from Moneyball very often. They, they would be very skeptical or very fearful or both. And I'd always say, no, 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 we're not trying to, we're not, we, I'm not claiming that these algorithms are, are better or smarter than you in any kind of a global sense. It's just in this very specific thing. There's specific things we're bad at. So I said, like, I also have imperfect vision, so I wear eyeglasses. I don't feel bad about that. Well, Kahneman teaches us that our, 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 our minds are biased, too. So equations are like eyeglasses for the mind. In the same way that eyeglasses correct my vision, algorithms can correct our judgments and decisions sometimes. And another implication is that we're not trying to necessarily optimize an algorithm. We're trying to optimize a system from a human working with the algorithm. And this is sort of how I kind of started thinking about this, is that the projects that we did that succeeded were always the projects where the end user was part of the design process early on. They would help us just kind of come up with the overall design of the system. What are we trying to predict? Exactly how do we operationalize that? How, you know, you know, are we trying to predict profitability, loss ratio, over what time frame? What are we trying to exclude here? And then also there's specific hypotheses. You know, what drives a, a, an insurance claim or what drives a loss? You know, they, they might have hypotheses that they're wedded to and we want to test those hypotheses. And very often they'd work out. They couldn't estimate the, the, you know, the exact magnitude, but you know. And sometimes there'd be surprises. But the fact is, if they're part of the design and part of the overall building of the thing, it'll be a better algorithm. There'll also be a lot more social capital around it. People will be more likely to use it. So I think that's like, you know, kind of a modest example of human centered design for AI in action. We've been doing it all along. We just didn't call it that. And so I'm sort of generalizing to that experience, saying that the, this kind of newer field, you know, this kind of expanded field of AI, need, needs, needs this kind of thinking. And another buzzword you can't get around, uh, that you can't get away from right now in the business world is, is this theme of the future of work, right? Remember that Davos New York Times report I told, I, I showed early on with, with all these corporate executives wanting to get rid of most, most employees? That's a really bad idea. I mean, even Elon Musk said it was a mistake, it was his mistake to, get to, to ex excessively automate Tesla factories. He said humans are underrated. Um, there's a recent uh, Future of Work conference at uh, the Stanford Human Centered AI um, Institute, just, just launched about a month ago. And Hal Varian, the chief economist at Google, pointed out that of 250 job categories cataloged by the Census Department in 1950, only one has gone away since then, and that's elevator operator. But even elevator operators, some of the actual work they would do has been outsourced to people at the front desk because they would actually use common sense to, you know, oh, Gloria's office is over here, that, that kind of thing. Um, and so we don't want to get rid of humans, contrary to what the people at Davos thought. But what we, what we want to do is come up with, you know, the equivalent of freestyle chess. So I have been doing freestyle statistics in my career. I use freestyle statistics to create algorithms so that insurance underwriters or doctors or public sector caseworkers or hiring managers can do freestyle whatever they're doing. But even for other newer forms of AI, right? It, um, I, I think that um, Andrew Eng, the guy I quoted in my first slide, he, he, had, he had another tweet where he said, you know, we have deep learning algorithms that, that are more accurate than radiologists now. Should radiologists be worried? You know, should we be sending you know, kids to school in radiology? I seriously doubt that human radiologists will be replaced by algorithms, but I think something analogous to the freestyle chess story will happen to radiology. And so, you know, who knows, who knows what shape this is going to take, right? You know, so we don't, we don't want to get rid of people thinking scientifically, right, and knowing when to override the algorithm or how to interpret what the algorithm is saying and then how to explain that to people. But in the same way that those chess players could look and sightly into positions and use these three different, you know, ordinary laptops to kind of triangulate to, to the right thing to do, you know, maybe we're going to need radiologists who are trained to do something along those lines, to actually work with algorithms and maybe get a little bit better at things like communication, empathy, communicating probabilities, helping patients strategize with things. So it's not that the jobs will go away, but the mix of skills, characteristics of success, of success in those jobs might change, right? Just like the amateurs winning freestyle chess. Or just like me, a philosophy PhD, right, this airhead, I'd be training, I'd be managing people with PhDs in statistics, because I was using R and they were using SPSS, sorry. <laughs> it was freestyle statistics. Um, so that's, that's the thinking slow story. That's, that's kind of part A of my psychology lesson number two, but there's also thinking fast, remember? I, I have no time left over, but I'll, 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 I'll talk fast about thinking fast. Um, that, that another kind of point that Kahneman makes is that most of our mental operations are thinking fast. Thinking slow is effortful. We're not very good at it. We often need a lot of help with it. We need help from algorithms, right? That's thinking like a computer. It's thinking like Mr. Spock. It's thinking like an actuary, okay? 
Thinking fast is effortless, it's automatic. You just do it. You just see the pull handle, you pull it, right? Um, you, you got a plate full of food, you eat what's on the plate. And if it's a really big plate, you eat all of it. If it's a small plate, you eat less of it, right? And these are just kind of like heuristics. Or a heuristic can be very, very simple. It's like, I, you know, I, I don't want to like deliberate about every single decision. So if I'm, if I'm getting fish for dinner and it's a warm night, I'll, I'll have white wine. Otherwise, I'm going to get red wine. That's my heuristic at restaurants. It's not perfect, but, but, but I, get, I get by with it. So those are thinking fast decisions. And so it occurred to me that, how much time do I have left anyway? I should probably cut it quick. Yeah, well, I'm almost done. You can go another five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. All right, five more minutes. So it occurred to me, you know, going back to this idea that, you know, we don't care about alg algorithmic outputs. We care about better outcomes. Well, in, in, in scenarios like making a medical diagnosis, you know, figuring out does this person have cancer, deciding who to hire, which, you know, which, which baseball player to add to your team, you know, should I, should I sell insurance to this risk or not? Those are thinking slow decisions. Those are economic decisions. But there are other cases where I have an algorithm that, that points out a person whose behavior I want to change in some way. So like one example was in the Obama re-election campaign. Um, they, they had data scientists who would build algorithms to, to flag people who are persuadable. They wouldn't flag somebody who's destined to vote for Obama, because why, why bother trying to persuade that person? Nor would they reach out to people who are definitely going to, going to vote for the, for, um, for the Republican. But what they did do is they tried to flag people who were persuadable. Okay, people who are like sort of on the fence, or people who were leaning towards the Democrat, but they just like maybe not get around to voting. So that's great. This is what kind of marketing people do too. You, it, it's, it's great. You can flag people, um, you know, who are, who are kind of likely to you know be persuadable to vote to vote to vote the way you hope they're going to vote. But they also hired behavioral scientists to to you know to actually change their behavior in a way that they found desirable. And one trick they used was the so-called commitment contract. So if the person knocks on my door and says, you know, Jim, can we count on you to vote for Obama on Tuesday? And I say, sure, yeah, okay, I'll vote for Obama. They could walk away, and they might have actually wasted their time, even though I am persuadable, because, like, who's going to say I'm going to follow through? But what, what some of the campaign workers did in the Obama campaign was they, filled, they, they had the people they reached out to fill out a commitment card, saying, on Tuesday morning, I'm going to go to the corner of 4th and Wilshire at this place, and I'm going to pull the trigger for Obama, and they'll take this bus to work instead of that bus, and I'm going to call my boss at a time, and he'll know they're going to be an hour late. That's called a, co a commitment device, or a, or a, a pre-commitment card. All right? So if you articulate it to yourself, it's like you're thinking slow right now in a cold state, so when it's on Tuesday morning, you're in that kind of hot state, you're more likely to follow through. You've sort of like rewired your mental heuristics. So that, that's an example of what people in the nudge world call a behavioral insight. Okay. So that was the big um, revelation from about 10 years ago. People have been studying these biased heuristics for a long time. And then about 10 years ago, a group of economists like Richard Thaler, Cass Sunstein, George Lowenstein at Carnegie Mellon University, Matt Rabin at UC Berkeley, they had this idea that if situational factors drive our behavior to this, to this surprising extent in systematic ways, well, the implication of that is that there are other ways of getting people to change their behavior than giving them information or training them. If you just simply kind of redesign the environment in ways that kind of go with the grain of that human psychology, they're more likely to change their behavior. Okay? So a, fa a famous example from, from behavioral finance is if you automatically enroll people in retirement benefits, they're more likely to save for retirement than if they're automatically not enrolled but have to go to the HR department to fill out a complicated form. Rationally, economically, it makes no sense that filling out forms should stand in the way people save for retirement. But the empirical brute fact is it makes a big difference. So setting up defaults makes, makes a big difference. Okay? Or in the UK, there's a, there's a famous story where this, th this is actually the story that got the so-called behavioral insights team or nudge unit in the UK taken seriously. The uh, Inland Revenue Department wanted to get the citizens of England to pay their taxes on time. And what they'd been doing was sending out letters cajoling the citizens to pay their taxes. And it was actually Richard Thaler's suggestion. He said, just do what you're already doing. Take those letters, send them out to the people, but just do one thing differently. Add a line at the top of the letter saying, did you know that 9 out of 10 of your neighbors pay their taxes on time? And they, they did a randomized control trial. They just sent out the original letter out to randomly selected half the population, sent this new modified letter out to the other half, sat back and saw what happened, and they collected millions of pounds of additional revenue from the people who got that, 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 that modified letter. And he was thinking of, a, of an experiment done by, by the psychologist Robert Cialdini. He wrote the book Influence. That people are driven, often they're driven more by peer comparisons and social proof and what, what the perceived social norm is than economic arguments or even ethical, ethical arguments. Okay. So, that, so those are ideas of you know, taking all these quirks of human psychology, all these kind of like 
you know, predictable features, and just using those as design elements. And so Richard Thaler and Cass Dunsey wrote this book called Nudge, where they introduced this idea of choice architecture. We are kind of infusing these design elements into, I could give a whole talk on this, into, into the, the, the design of these choice, uh, these choice environments. And what I found fascinating was that Richard Thaler was actually influenced by Don Norman's book, that same book on design thinking. Essentially, Nudge is a sequel to the design of everyday things. So they're applying Don Norman's design thinking to choice environments. This has been a big, big movement. I'll just give one example of how we've used this at work. We were hired by one of the states, New Mexico, to build what we first thought of as being a statistical fraud detection algorithm. You know, so there's a problem with unemployment insurance benefits. If somebody is unemployed and they're supposed to log on every week to certify that they're, you know, that they're looking for a new job and certify how much money they made last week, what's to prevent that person from lowballing how much money they earned last week? Okay. So they, they, hired, they, they hired us to build an algorithm to essentially to suss out the bad guys. You know, can we use machine learning, people's web click behavior, other information about them to figure out who's likely to be um, underreporting their earnings? I immediately said that's not going to work. This going to be a huge problem with false positives. If the overall base rate is low, no matter how powerful our classifier is, base theorem tells you the posture probability is going to be low too. Right? So if the overall base rate is 5%, we've got this very powerful classifier, maybe somebody in decile 10 will have like a 1 in 3 chance of, 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 of um, underreporting their earnings. So you've got this powerful algorithm that isn't worthless. But how do you, again, remember, we don't care about the algorithmic output, we care about the outcome. How do you act on that, on that information? The Gloria has a one in three chance of being a fraudster, whereas Jim is only a one in 20 chance. Sorry, Gloria. What do you do with that information? So I suggested don't use this information to shut off people's benefits. Rather, let's, let's use this to nudge people. So, so rather than, we, so we, we never used the algorithmic kind of benefits because that would have gotten us into trouble. But what we did do is for those people, maybe if, if Gloria's been logging on, every week for the past four or five weeks, say at nine o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, saying, I earned $200 last week driving Uber. Okay? And then in week five, Gloria logs on at Saturday afternoon at four o'clock, and now she reports $520. So things have changed, and she's reported more income, but it's not a lot more, so it might be a little suspicious. Maybe she's in decile 10 all of a sudden. All of a sudden, she sees a pop-up message saying, Gloria, nine of 10 of your neighbors in Bernalillo County report their earnings on time. So we use the same behavioral insight that they used in the, in the UK. We were able to do a randomized control trial online. So in Silicon Valley, this is called A-B testing. And what we found was that this kind of one-two punch of machine learning and um, choice architecture reduced improper payments by about 50%. Um, now, this might sound like manipulation, and this is where the ethics of influence come into this. So, so, you know, so ethical considerations need to come into AI, because a lot of this is going to be about making suggestions to people. So I, I really do think that nudge and choice architecture needs to be part of the AI paradigm. We need to think about ethics at the same time. I'm sorry I've run over, by the way. Um, but I would argue this is actually a case of, of ethical AI. I'll just say why real quick, and then I'll turn up, uh, open it to questions. Another state that did this exact same project, and they used the algorithm to shut up people's benefits, and they actually got into trouble. I mean, they, they were on the Rachel Maddow show in the Guardian newspaper, and they really were taking away benefits from people that needed them. And that never happened in this case. There, there's an asymmetry here that we exploited. If the person is reporting their earnings accurately and they're a false positive, no, no harm really done. They just ignore the message. Otherwise, it's, 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 it's you know, actually getting, getting um, people to do, um, do the honest thing. So, so I think that in certain cases, nudge can enable a more effective and ethical AI. And that's a, that's a specific form of human-centered design. And with that, I'll end it and uh, open it to questions in the 30 seconds we have left. Sorry, I went over. Was I carrying coals to Newcastle? Was that old hats, you guys, or was, 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 there, was there new stuff in there? That was my question. Any it's reaction? It's synthesis. What's that? It's really good. It's very okay. Synthesis. I think we have some questions. Well, um, yeah. it's kind of a philosophy of AI question, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, you know, I, I understood how you framed the evolution of AI. Yeah. And, and historical aspects. What I didn't hear and what I expected to hear in terms of human-centered issues were, were questions of embodiment. Hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so I understand that mm -hmm. in your particular 
area of work, you're constantly working with data. But the, 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 in a sense, the, the answer to the kinds of things that humans are good at doing yeah. and the kinds of things that sure. um, automated reasoning systems are good at doing is that humans live in the world. Yep. Yep. I, I tend to agree with you. I don't feel like I know enough about it to comment on it. But yeah, I, I suspect that you tell me if, if you disagree. I suspect that what you're saying is sort of related to the whole Moravix paradox idea. I mean, the, it turns out to be more, more doable to kind of replicate the reasoning of people who've gone to grad school for radiology than just to kind of figure out how to move around in the world. You know, we've got all this like millennia of evolution that makes us really, really good at kind of moving around the world and saying, oh, let me move this bottle out of the way so I can fix the pipe. You're like, when are you going to build a robot to do that? You know, mm -hmm. Rodney Brooks would mm -hmm. say, not in my lifetime, mm -hmm. right? Clear. Yeah, and I, so I think that what you're saying is sort of related to this more of its paradox idea, which I think is a very fundamental well, idea. It, it comes to a really fundamental notion of what artificial intelligence theorists regard as intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, which is not biological intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, essentially the perpetuation of Victorian logical reasoning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, when you started, you said that, that you were saying things about reasoning and algorithms. Mm -hmm. They, the distinction is really clear for me because, I'm sorry, I don't mean to give this talk, but yeah. the distinction is really clear for me because the intellectual tradition of traditional AI is the tradition of enlightenment, rational, reasoning mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with human psychology or human embodiment or human biology or human sensing or the way humans move in the world. Mm -hmm. The things that humans are good at doing mm -hmm have to do with the fact that they are bodies that have brains. Mm -hmm. The things that computers are good at doing are not those things because computers don't have bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but sometimes we want to do things that computers are good at. Like, you know, it, it, in a lot of these business scenarios that I work in, we want, you know, these embodied crazy humans that are really good at moving around in the world and fall in love with people and stuff. We want them to kind of act like Mr. Spock. And they're just lousy at it. So yeah. let's just give them help. That's all. Right. That's all. And it, it, at a high level, predictive models, AI technologies, and nudges are all ways of helping us, right? I'm, I'm really bad at my finance. So why doesn't the IRS pre-populate my tax forms? You know, why, why, not, why not automatically enroll the things? That's, that's another way of just helping us out. So these are all ways of kind of like overcoming limit, unfortunate limitations, you know, in which, you know, maybe we can get around in the wild, but now in this modern world we've created, we're not so good at getting around. So these are just like little, like, prostheses. That's all I'm saying. And I, again, like, I feel like for you guys this might be obvious, but in the business world, this is the paradigm we need. But I also think that, you know, and, and it's a training thing too, right? We, we, we need to train AI researchers that, that think in, in terms of, like, the areas, you know, we want to, we want to kind of create this complementary notion. We want the opposite of that, of this crazy Davos headline. We want people to be thinking actively about what are we good at, what are we not good at, and how can we create systems that overcome our, 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 our frailties. And, and by the way, not exploit our frailties, which is what Cambridge Analytica was all about. Any other comments? Yeah. Um, actually, I kind of had a similar comment to that. Um, it, I, I am very interested in questions of affect, mm -hmm. and it seems like that's a very different kind of mm -hmm. intelligence mm -hmm. than Victorian intelligence. But, um, that's not my question. <laughs> my question is actually um, more about one of your slides and one of your examples that had to do with um, the equations having biases themselves. Yes. Uh -huh. And the facial recognition camera that can't recognize a black face. Right, yeah. So I love this idea of a kind of symbiotic, I mean, that's where I, I see like the affect or that kind of embodiment or being in the world coming in, especially if our algorithms are based off of this very particular kind of mm -hmm. Cartesian intelligence that we know is kind of actually smaller and less relevant than we probably always thought. Is it, are you talking about like the Antonio Damasio kind yeah. of stuff? Yeah. So um, my question for you then is how do we build an equation that um, doesn't have those biases? And I'm, oh. I'm, I'm, I was hoping you were maybe going to go there a little mm -hmm. bit. I don't, I don't know, that's, that's a big and hard question, but I'm also thinking of um, Sakhir Noble's recent book, Algorithm of Oppression, about mm -hmm. how racism is coded into Google search right. results. So that's kind of where I'm living, and I'm right. going to be able to insight on that. Well, I don't know if these are like profound insights, but you know, honestly, there's an irony here. I mean, when I, when I started, again, like, 
my roots are very modest here. I started as an actuary. But ironically, when we were doing our work, you know, when I first started, it was before we had fancy software algorithms to do fancy computers. But we, we thought very, very long and hard about how the data we have is not necessarily the same as the, as the future scenario. We need to make all these adjustments to the data before we analyze it and create an algorithm to guide future decisions. And I feel like, again, I think that that's kind of what the machine, there's this old, um, there's this really nice slogan from Brad Efron at Stanford, he's a very prominent statistician. He said, those who ignore statistics are convent, condemned to reinvent it. <laughs> so, you know, I, I feel like in the machine learning community, it's kind of like, there's this kind of Kaggle competition idea of data science. You guys all know about Kaggle, right? You got this beautiful data set with a very well-posed problem, and whoever can create the algorithm that's, that has the highest accuracy out of sample wins the $50,000. And that's a very streamlined, stylized, gamified view of what data science is. In reality, you don't care about the data, you care about the world. And then you want to make another decision that affects the world. So you want to start with the data that either reflects the way the world is or the way the world should be. So I, you know, I think that's a big part of it for creating these unbiased algorithms is figuring out what is the right sampling frame. And so there, I know there are people doing research on this right now. They're computer scientists. I heard a talk by a, a computer scientist at Princeton who's working on this exact thing. You know, how do you come up with better sampling frames to avoid racially biased deep learning algorithms? Um, but, be, but beyond that, if somebody just kind of like, if an algorithm just falls out of the sky, I'm actually trying to start this at my company. I think that I'm in a big four auditing consulting firm, right? We're an auditing firm. Why shouldn't we have an algorithm auditing practice? Companies' balance sheets are audited, right, by, by <coughs> third parties with a you know, reputation for probity. Why can't we have a new branch of data science called algorithm auditing? Yeah. And, you know, and, and, you know I, I alluded to this earlier. This, um, it's very interesting research, this ProPublica study. That was, you know, there were data scientists using R behind the scenes of this, analyzing, analyzing data. And it prompted some very interesting academic research. Um, it was Sendhil Malinathan, who's now at the University of Chicago, and John Kleinberg at Cornell Computer Science, and a PhD student, Manish Raghavan, who I did a webinar for me a few weeks ago. And they, they're the ones who proved that result I alluded to earlier about trade-offs and different notions of algorithmic fairness. You, you, can, you, can, you, know, you, can, get un, you can get equally well calibrated, or you can get the same false positive rate for both classes, but you can't get both if the overall base rate is different. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a simple mathematical result, but I think it's kind of a profound philosophical result in a certain way. Um, and so like, part of algorithm auditing could be just highlighting trade-offs, saying, I don't know what the right answer is, you guys tell me. Or if a, simple, a more familiar example would be you know, the, the algorithm used for disease recognition. What, what is the right decision threshold? You know, if, if the logistic regression says 80%, you know, is that, is, should you give people the treatment then, or should it be 90%, should it be 70%? So what is the right trade-off between false positives and true positives? Um, so I, I don't have an answer, because it's gonna be a lot of trade-offs, but I think those are the kinds of things, again, those, that's, it's not really human-centered design, but that's another kind of way in which we need to enrich our paradigm, I think. All right, oh, so sorry. I would like, yes. Okay.